So for me, if you're in a lead generation environment where you're trying to get people on the phone and then sell them on your solution, one of the best ways to use AI is, you know, you're taking notes about them into your CRM. Uh, you're gonna put a proposal in front of them. Uh, one of the things I'll do is I'll dump my notes into ChatGPT and ask it to write a thank you letter based off of these notes. And then you get this beautiful personalized note that specifically refers to the things you talked about and how you can help solve for it. Mm -hmm. And then you go, you take it, you edit it. This is a, a signature part of my sales process. It used to take me about an hour and now it takes me about 10 minutes. We're here with Dan Greck from the Biz Hack Academy. He teaches small businesses just like yours how to use AI in marketing and sales. Dan, what's up? up? Mark, awesome to be here. Uh, me too. Dan, tell me, why do small businesses need to be using AI now? You know, a lot of times you hear AI is talked about AI versus human. Uh, and really the actual, and you know, AI replacing humans and jobs and taking our jobs. What's actually happening is there's going to be it's not AI versus human, it's AI plus human versus human alone. If you're a small business that isn't using AI, you are gonna lose and you're gonna lose to small businesses that use AI. But I gotta say, Dan, I hear this said a lot. You're not gonna lose your job to AI, you're gonna lose your job to a human that's using AI. What's the difference? I'm still losing my damn job. You are, you are still losing your job, but you better, but you could be the guy who's keeping the job or taking the job. And the, the thing is that there are certain tasks uh, that AI are going to take over, but the human intelligence is required to make the work actually useful. And then it frees you up to do more and better stuff. I mean, I don't think anybody feels like they have enough time to do everything they want to be doing. So I think in the end, uh, at least where we are right now, uh, the bigger risk is if you're doing repetitive tasks that could be automated intelligently, you're at risk and you need to learn how to manage those automations. What, one of the things I like to say is we're going from being coders to debuggers, from writers to editors. That's really good. I, I, I totally agree with that too. And people, it's funny, people say like, AI is not creative. It is, it is. Have you seen the art? Have you seen the music? Have you seen the, the, the written word? It is, it's very creative. It's incredibly creative, and it's also an instigator of greater human creativity. In other words, if you use it like a brainstorm partner, it'll help take you to new and different places. Let's talk about sales, because I think that that's, listen, I'm an entrepreneur. I want to make some damn money. I want to yeah. make some more money. So where can I use AI to facilitate more cash in my pocket? So for me, if you're in a lead generation environment where you're trying to get people on the phone and then sell them on your solution. One of the best ways to use AI is, you know, you're taking notes about them into your CRM. Uh, you're gonna put a proposal in front of them. Uh, one of the things I'll do is I'll dump my notes into ChatGPT and ask it to write a thank you letter based off of these notes. And then you get this beautiful personalized note that specifically refers to the things you talked about and how you can help solve for it. Mm. And then you go, you take it, you edit it. This is a, a signature part of my sales process. It used to take me about an hour and now it takes me about 10 minutes. I was using a, uh, all right, no, it wasn't. I am using this program called Avoma.ai. It's a Zoom assistant. So it goes into my Zoom calls, it transcribes everything, it writes out key, it even identifies key moments. Like maybe if the person I'm speaking to has an objection, it notifies that. It also, qu quick sales tip, the less you speak, the more you sell. It'll also identify who's doing the most speaking. So it's kind of funny, like after I get off a sales call, I'll be like, damn, I spoke 60% of the time. How do I get down to 20%? You know, so anyway, Avoma is a tool that I've, I've really liked. How do you spell that? Avoma, A-V-O-M-A. I Avoma. love that because what it does is it's allowing you to train. It's yeah. allowing you to improve. It gives a whole new set of sales management tools. So, you know, there's a great line in sales. I say that, you know, salespeople grow your company. Sales managers grow salespeople. Right. So one of the biggest challenges you have as a sales manager is it's very hard to be on every call or to listen to every call. These tools allow you to put data uh, behind the analysis of your salespeople's calls. So another example of what this could mean is you could probably have sales managers managing more salespeople. Yeah, great point, great point. What about the information on the front end? Like, is there any way that you're recommending or that you're using AI to kind of like 
help prepare the people for the sales call? Yeah, so uh, research. So one of the questions you can ask ChatGPT is, let's say you're selling into a company. You could say, tell me about X company or tell me what you know about X company. And that ChatGPT will then respond with information. That's a good way to check that they actually have good information about the company. And then if they know the company, like tell me what you know about Microsoft, and they know Microsoft, because one of the issues I should say is large language models are trained on the internet. Mm. And if there isn't a lot of content on the internet about that company, and it has to predate September 2021, because ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 are trained on the internet circa 2020, uh, September 2021. Uh, they may not know that much about the company or they may not know what's happened to the company recently. If In cases like that, you need to feed it the information. So you could scrape their website, load it into ChatGPT, then it has that information. But once it has that information or if it already knows it, you can then ask it, what would be five things that I could say – uh, that would be valuable to an HR manager at Microsoft that is aligned with their core values. Yeah. You know, yeah, another so human... kind of like brainstorming for the call to kind of get an idea before you get on I mean, the call. Things you probably should be doing and aren't. Right. Um, another. You can also, by the way, you can automate that to an extent. Um, I connected, I connected chat GPT to my calendar. So if someone books on my calendar, ChatGPT can actually write down a list of potential questions. Uh, exactly. it could, you know, a list, like to your exact point, it's automatic. So as soon as I hop into the call, I can just go, oh, I've already got a Google form. It's ready to go. I've got my notes. Or you can automate it with something like Go High Level so that it's, it's in, including notes into your CRM automatically, which is something that Salesforce is doing. And that's a, like, so we were talking about this a little bit. You're like, listen, the big guys, the sales forces of the world, like, you don't, we don't have, as a small business owner, you don't have the same resources to compete. Yeah. Basically, um, I want to give one other quick idea before we move on and talk yep. about how this is getting integrated in HubSpot and Salesforce. The other little idea, there's a tidbit, but uh, I don't know if you guys can hear, but there's a lot of background noise because we're right now in Tampa for the EO Nerve Conference. EO is Entrepreneurs Organization. So uh, it's happy hour time. Uh, you're standing <laughs> between me and the drink. Um, but one of the best use cases I've ever heard from a sales perspective is we all know that the pregame for a conference is where it's all at. What you should do when you go to a conference is have lined up 20 phone uh, meetings, in-person meetings with sales prospects. Do it's any sale. of us do it? No, we don't. So what you could do uh, with ChatGPT is you could write a series of personalized emails to your targets ahead of time inviting them to a cup of coffee. Now, what's different about this and what you would normally do is if you even get around to writing it, it's probably a generic, but if you can leverage ChatGPT, you can quickly personalize it and then you can get a much higher response rate. I have a client who did this. Uh, his normal response rate was 12%. It went to 40% when it was personalized. Wow. And you can use their LinkedIn profiles as well as the publicly available information on LinkedIn. You could say, hey, you know, we both went to the same college or we're both members of this organization or we both share a passion about this topic. And that will create a much higher likelihood of a response. And then the follow-up similarly, you know, you have the notes from the call, you load them in, you can have that personalized follow-up. These are things, look, marketing uh, is one-to-many, sales is one-to-one. -one. You can make things much more personalized if you feed it information, but let it do the hard work of writing the thing. That's definitely, to me, what's most exciting about AI is creating customization at scale. You know, creating those custom experiences at scale. Because honestly, all of your data is all out on the internet anyway. Absolutely. Why not leverage that? I was speaking to Mike Wynn on the podcast. He's developing this calendar app. It might be live. I'm not sure if it's live yet, but what it does is it asks you for your email and other like basic information, but it takes your email and it scrapes the web. It scrapes the entire internet for your, you know, where you were born, where you live, are you married? Where do you work? Where did you work? Where'd you go to school? So as soon as you get on the call, you already know like their entire life story. So, you know, like, are they a dog person, right? Like, oh, yeah, I'm just messing with my dog. I love my dog so much, you know. It, you know, it, it just makes it easier to connect on these types of topics sooner. Absolutely. Mark, have you ever asked ChatGPT to tell it what it knows about you, what it knows about Mark Savant? I have not. You got to do it. I... It's, it's fucked up. <laughs> Excuse my language. It's crazy. So, <laughs> so I did it. So 
I, I'm actually not the most famous Dan Gretsch, it turns out. There's another Dan Gretsch out there who is a uh, music producer from England uh, for Radiohead. Whoa. But I went and I said, tell me about Dan Gretsch, the former journalist turned entrepreneur. And he came back to, back to me with like a very detailed bio about me, almost like a Wikipedia entry. And there were, everything about it was exactly right, except for one line where it said I worked for a company I didn't work for. That's wild. This yeah. is called hallucination. Yeah. And so it's really important with everything that I've said so far is you got to fact check anything before you send it to a client because there's nothing more offensive than a fake personalized thing with wrong information. It's like spelling their name wrong. It like has the exact opposite effect. So the one hmm. big caveat I would say is AI doesn't fact check and it does a thing called hallucinate or make stuff up. And it, one of the ways you can see is if you're a pretty public person like I have been, uh, like you are, uh, it, it knows you, uh, but it doesn't always know you accurately. That's right. It'll, it'll actually lie to you too. And like then, I, I mentioned this in the talk, like there's this attorney who is doing using ChatGPT for research, and it's he said, are all these cases that you're citing real? ChatGPT's like, yeah, they're real. I got it from LexisNexis. You're good. And now now he's getting like reprimanded in court by the judge, like. Sorry, lawyer. Like, you, you messed up. Chat, G, Chat GPT lawyers out here. Joe Rogan the other day was talking about uh, having an AI president. And I can't even imagine, like, the implications of that. Can I ask you about journalism for a second, too? Yeah, just before, because I don't want to leave it um, hanging, and then we'll talk about journalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, love that topic. So in November of 2022, Chat GPT is released, and it is a neutron bomb. I mean, it is the biggest tech release in history. In two months, it got 100 million users. It took TikTok, the second fastest, nine months. Yeah. Threads ended up getting there faster, but only because they just were leveraging Facebook. Instagram, so, yeah. Yeah, Instagram users. So we've never seen anything like this in the history of technology. And a lot of the attention from media is really in this Microsoft versus Google uh, where Microsoft is a dominant uh, investor in ChatGPT's uh, creator, OpenAI. Google has its own competing technology. Recently, Amazon bought Anthropic, which is a third competitor. And so all the media attention is getting focused there. But very quietly, Canva, Slack. Adobe. Adobe, HubSpot, Salesforce are integrating AI into their core platform. And that is when it's going to go from a novelty to mainstream use. You know, there's um, something called Copilot, which is an add-on to the Microsoft 365 suite, where instead of going to ChatGPT, it's built into Word. Mm. So instead of writing something in Word, you say, describe what you want, and ChatGPT will write it inside a Word. Same for Outlook. Same for Excel. You can start doing natural language querying of databases. You don't need to know SQL or how to program in Excel or how to figure out how to do a pivot table. Good luck to you. Like you can say, create a pivot table comparing this data set to this data set in natural language. And with Copilot, it's going to start doing it. Same is going to be true for Google. They call it Duet. Mm. So that's the next quiet revolution that's in the process. I mean, this there are enterprise clients using this already. This is the today of AI in, in software. And, and you know, frankly, if you're not using AI, if you're not ready to like maximize its use, you're not gonna be able to compete against the people that are. That, it's not gonna be optional. It's like not knowing how to use a computer or type. Right. Yeah. Right, and we all have been around people who are like, well, how do I do this or how do I do that? Like, it's not optional. So I think starting to use it early and often, putting those systems in yeah. place, absolutely crucial. You know, I, I also think it's kind of an interesting segue to the future of journalism. Yes. You know, there's a writer strike in Hollywood, which isn't necessarily journalism, but, you know. The creative, the creative class is freaked out. Did you hear that Sarah Silverman sued OpenAI? Did she really? For, for basically training using her jokes as a training set because you can go ask ChatGPT to write a sarah silverman style joke and it does a bang on job right and she's pissed about it so her and a other a bunch of other writers sued ChatGPT's but, but maker you see here why this is why that's bullcrap because that's like saying anybody that i ever influence cannot exist anymore you know what i'm saying because yeah. like i will create especially in comedy like you're always quoting like well 
you know, how many jokes have been made about something that Trump did or said, right? From it, copyright perspective, it's super complicated, this one. Like, it's not clear who's in the right and what. Th there's nothing in the current copyright law that speaks to this. This is all okay from a copyright perspective. But let me give you, like, we're going to talk about journalism. So the New York Times and other major media outlets are contemplating a lawsuit of ChatGPT <laughs> as well. And the reason why is because they're trained on their article set. What that means is everything the New York Times has ever published, ChatGPT knows about and can use in its responses, but they did not pay for or license that knowledge. Yeah, but again, that's like me saying, like anytime someone's in a conversation and says, oh, I, I, I want to cite the New York, does that just mean we should never cite the New York Times anymore? The difference is ChatGPT charges for and is monetizing this. Okay. So, and then the other piece is, look, you can use it, but you didn't ask for our permission give us a licensing fee so that what they're really looking for is to force ChatGPT to pay to use their, to use their, their, their data and their and, platform. And, and Associated Press <laughs> just cut a deal with ChatGPT, with OpenAI for precisely that. Interesting. So it's, it's, it's a complicated issue, right? Like this is copyrighted material. ChatGPT is generating new content based off of copyrighted material. Is that okay? But what if I'm an independent, like independent journalism, independent content creators, like those, those are kind of becoming a big thing too. So what if I'm an independent content creator or whatever, and I reference the New York Times, and because of the content I'm putting out, ChatGPT uses my content yeah. to create, and then this, so this leads us into a really, really questionable issue, is how is ChatGPT and how is AI being trained? What is the information they're getting to create new information that is absorbed by other AI that creates new information, all of a sudden it becomes a complete cluster because we nobody's going to know yeah. what's actually legit no, this or not. This is a hornet's nest. And it gets even more complicated when you start talking about audio and video. So uh, do you know about Deepfake Drake? I've not heard of Drake, but I know Deepfake Tom Hanks, Deepfake. Yeah, so, um, uh, so, Deep, so Drake is a musical artist. Uh, and he um, used to collaborate with this other music artist named The Weeknd. But, you know, whatever. They went in their separate ways. And for the last 10 years, the two of them haven't done anything together. Well, a couple months ago, a new song emerges. And it's Drake and The Weeknd collaborating for the first time in a decade. And the whole world goes nuts. And it's it turns out it was an AI-generated song. I remember that, yeah. And it was like top of the iTunes charts yeah, for a little while. Yeah, Universal Music Group freaks out. Uh, forces Spotify and Apple to take it down. But it really becomes interesting when you ask the question, AI is getting better and better at mimicking the voices with even just an hour or two of recording. Who owns the sound and tenor of your voice? Is that something you can copyright? Does Drake own that? Because if it's lyrics that he didn't write, but it's his voice sounding like his wow. voice. Wow. I never that is a really that is like a tricky one. So where is the line is very blurry. Well, and to your point, this has not been solved. It won't be solved. I actually confronted Matt Gates about this a few weeks ago. I was at an event. I was like, dude, y'all are like, why is nobody talking about AI and how it impacts society as a whole? Yeah. Like, you're like, okay, Kamala Harris has it, problem solved. Like, what are y'all doing? Because yeah. this is going to come. But if the, the flip side is not to go off the deep end of like all the fears and the bombs and the war and all the cyber warfare that's happening. But I think with this AI revolution that has not been solved, it creates massive opportunity for those that are getting involved, finding solutions, finding unique angles. Because, because it's so new, it's, it's, it's like the World Wide Web all over again. Yes. So let's land this plane for your business owner audience, right? How do you make money off this? So one is obviously you can leverage it for marketing. I'm very expert in that. Leverage it for sales. We talked about that. But there's a whole nother opportunity, which is I think the true gold mine in all of this, which is really very much like the Wild West when the internet was first invented, which, you know, I'm 46 years old and I was in grade school, you know, when the internet was being invented and the real gold rush that was happening happened when I was in high school and college. So I wasn't around for it. This is the next great technological revolution. Right. I'm in my mid forties. I have my full, like I'm in the flower of the best moment of my career. I am so psyched about what's coming on the horizon. And the big opportunity that I see in AI for business is this. So when you're a corporate, like a fortune 500, 
you have enough money to have a whole department and maybe even dedicated AI researchers building large language models and other AI applications specific to your company. This becomes competitive advantage and proprietary tech. And the other side of the spectrum is the mom and pops, the solopreneurs, the businesses sub $5 million, where they're just using off-the-shelf tools like, like ChatGPT or yeah. all the integrations into all their common software like HubSpot. There's this middle ground opportunity for what I call intelligent automation. Intelligent automation is automation enhanced by AI to save time on repetitive processes that have a high business value but don't honestly need to be done in exclusively by human beings. Yeah. And those are very specific to particular companies and particular industries. And we're going to start to see a boom of custom-built intelligent automations that are uh, a huge opportunity. It's too small for the big guys to worry about, but there's a ton of money to be made and it will have an immediate ROI for the client. So a good example of this is, is we've seen this in the CRM or customer relationship management space, right? You have the HubSpot and you have the sales forces and those CRMs are great, but you then have a million little micro CRMs that serve niche industries, you know, mind body for the health and fitness industry and so forth. And they make a fortune serving a hyper serving a niche. Yeah. That's like the same idea as a CRM, but intelligent automation, that is a huge opportunity. So if you have an expertise in a certain industry, if you really understand their needs, if you have a lot of contacts, if you create an AI automation that hyper serves that niche, you can make a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, or or if you're first on board to adopt that technology too, you know, which is why you need to subscribe to the show. Dan, where's the best place for us to find you? So thank you so much for asking and having me here today. I hope this was useful. Uh, I'm at bizhack.com, B-I-Z-H-A-C-K.com, the intersection of business and technology. Uh, we run courses. We do uh, training and consulting and coaching. Um, we have a course on this topic at bizhack.ai and then you can find us online at youtube and twitter and threads and facebook at at bizhack academy killer killer dan thanks for joining the show here today brother thank you so much mark loved it